I want to talk about the, the West, uh, civilization in the West, Europe and America, as a failed civilization. Fifty years ago, it was dead, and we've just been watching the course develop pus since then. Um, in the context of this little video on causality, uh, Deming went around the world as a quality guru saying that to make one problem, one root problem, go away forever, you had to do 625 permanent changes in the processes around that problem. Um, and this was 25 uh, causes of that root cause. And each of those you had to have 25 solution uh, actions for, so 625 actions total. Uh, and that problems didn't permanently go away because we didn't work in the whole system that sustains the problem. And uh, we didn't make uh, 625 changes. We tried to make two or three local changes right where the problem appeared. We didn't change parts of the system not re removed from the problem that contributed to it because we didn't view things in a system way and because managers were ignorant people who didn't know statistics. They still are. Um, and so uh, Total Quality introduced the idea of making hundreds of changes throughout the system to make one root problem go away forever. Now, what is that? That's Buddhist causality. 10,000 bee stings is the way you move an elephant. It's very traditional common sense in Japan and Asia and Thailand and completely missing in the West and the United States. The West and the United States is a aristocratically dominated, very, very dictatorial culture compared to the East. And so these tyrants in the West, every little father, every little boss, uh, they wanted to have the one right idea that changes everything. And they were lazy. They were aristocrats, inherited wealth, uh, sexually screwed up. Uh, and tortured in public schools or private schools in English or whatever they call them. And, uh, and so these distorted, twisted souls uh, were looking for the, the little one tipping point where slight inputs would change the whole system state. And they had a mania for that. I mean, it was the lazy man's way to change the world. Uh, in Asia, it was sort of, you know, the hire 10,000 coolies and let them dig a dam uh, way to do the world. So you have these two styles of causality, changing everything in the system to make one root cause go away or looking for that one tipping point to make it go away. Now, who built the best quality in world history? Well, the Western way was tried after World War I for 75 years, and it got its ass whipped by Japanese quality. So the 10,000 bee sting way for doing quality was tested against the Western way. It came developed after the Western way with less resources and less fame, and it beat the hell out of the Western way. So the two have had a, a fair fight, and the 10,000 bee stings beat the hell out of the uh, aristocrat single tipping point way. Um, now, on the other hand, you have stem cells invented in the West, and they're going to create, make biology the biggest science, four times bigger than uh, than uh, physics ever was, with Harvard and MIT both having three biology departments and only one physics department. So that's a Western tipping point deal. So that's pretty big, too. So both of them have power. But in a fair fight for actual ordinary people in the world, the 10,000 Beast Things way was competing against the tipping point way to quality, and the 10,000 Beast Things way uh, won hands down, no contest. It wiped out. 11 industries based on the tipping point aristocrat elite way. Uh, now, I was in America delivering artificial intelligence to the General Motors workforce and saw this way of giving the technology, sending some PhDs to go study it, bring it back to R&D, and then make an R&D pilot project, they called it, and then demonstrate it to managers at P&G who just laughed or vomited because the project was so slow, so complicated, explained so badly, so unbusinesslike in the way it was positioned and defined. And so hopelessly complicated and expensive and risky that only an absolute fool would touch it with a 10-foot bullet. It's a career burner, was what they called it, career burner. And uh, and so they went to these uh, show and tells of these R&D guys with, with a kind of pity uh, for these poor, deluded PhDs who had no idea how ugly the case was they were making for their technology with their own eliteness. And so I said, okay, let's just strip out the Harvard and elite social uh, uh, European aristocratic leftovers in American culture. Let's strip that stuff out, take away the snobbery, and look at the knowledge and how would you actually distribute it. And the obvious answer was uh, artificial intelligence circles. Japanese quality circles, 400 of them at a time, recruit them competitively, uh, give them training in knowledge modeling, because they can't do software, but they can do knowledge modeling of their own knowledge very well. Uh, train them in knowledge modeling, have them do six months of that, then bring in expert programmers to turn their knowledge model into code, then have them test that and get some more knowledge, and then uh, six months later, bring in some more programmers for two weeks to turn that into code and do three sets of that. Six months, six months, six months, 18 months, have a working expert system, 400 of them at a time. 
in a big corporation, done by ordinary work groups in every part of the corporation, no PhDs anywhere except maybe a few uh, working as my servants to help me design the system or something like that, or do copies on a copy machine. Um, take all the eliteness out, and then you would, number one, make the technology fast, riskless, cheap, effective, locally useful, building careers locally, and liked. And guess what? 400 more circles turn into 800 circles a year later when you're recruited because people get their career boosted and make money using this stuff. It's popular, not unpopular. Uh, so that was sort of my personal version of trying the 10,000 beasting ways of doing AI to a workforce as opposed to the one elite uh, tipping point uh, Harvard snobby way of doing it to a workforce. So the, the uh, 10,000 beasting way, when you put it in a fair fight, beats the hell out of the Western the tipping point way, at least in two cases. Uh, now let's look at causality in general beyond uh, the total quality and the Buddhist uh, uh, moving the elephant case. Let's look at finding valid and validating causal mechanisms. There's a lot of causal talk that goes on where the mechanism by which X change causes Y result, the mechanism is either unstated, unclear, or doesn't exist. And so you always have to push for the mechanism. Statements of co-change, changing at the same time, mean nothing. It turns out that people, if you drink more coffee, you have less car accidents. What is the mechanism? There is no mechanism. It's called a spurious correlation. It's real in the data all over the world, and it has no mechanism. It's not a causal relationship. It's a spurious relationship. If you think about infinitely many thinkable variables, then half of them are going to have correlations of each other, even though they're unconnected. And so you can always find these spurious, and that's what, you know, folk wisdom and idiots do and destroy their bodies with uh, herbal medicines and all this crap because they see these little correlations and they take them as causes because they want to believe. And, you know, religious leaders do the same thing. Uh, let's look at uh, finding tipping points. Now, there are tipping points in theory that change everybody else's theorization afterwards. And there are tipping points in practice that change how people do things afterwards. And so you have at least those two kinds of tipping points. Now, the tragic thing about modern PhD research is that you don't aim it at any tipping points, for the most part. Most professors don't. You can. There are ways to find tipping points, but they don't use them. Number four is improving the way people solve in society. Now, Deming and uh, more than him, the Japanese uh, general 36-step problem-solving model, root problem identification, root cause identification, root solution identification, root implementation identification, root impact and error identification, and normalization. Those, uh, each of them with the same six sub-steps, that 36-step model of solving, getting every worker in a workforce to use the same solving process, that really improves social solving. And if you want to make Western society decent, and I mean decent in terms of the, uh, less than 200 serial killers operating every day in America, if you want to make it decent so little girls can go to school without being raped or murdered, then and that's just decency that America doesn't even try for. So religious, so right-wing, and, the, and then all their little girls are just uh, tortured going to school worrying about being tortured to death or, or raped in the woods. I mean, that's the kind of... Uh, hypocritical society America is from the point of view of Asians and Europeans. Very religious, and then they, unlike Europeans and uh, Japanese, have to worry about little girls being murdered and, uh, by serial killers and rapists uh, whenever they're a half an hour late for something. Uh, you just watch the face of Americans who come to Japan for the first time, and their daughter is 30 minutes late on the train, and they turn white and they shake. And, uh, and it takes you know real effort mentally to tell themselves, I don't have to op react that way here. They don't have serial killers operating in this nation but once every eight years, like one local one, uh, and not 200 every day. It's, you know, you know, the last time uh, an elementary school kid was killed on the trains of Tokyo was 27 years ago, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the fact that there are decent societies in the world and that America is not one uh, is just common sense all over the world, except where you self-praise, you know, you're an American and because you have a big GDP, the fact that all your little girls get killed regularly. Uh, doesn't bother you. Yeah, right. How much GDP does it take to, to, to pay you for the worry of when your daughter is half an hour late? Um, you see little girls all the time riding the train system all over Tokyo, and uh, all the adults are helping them. All of the adults are watching out for them. And it, you know, you're proud. You're proud that you've got a society where little girls can ride the train anywhere they want, and no one's going to let them be uh, upset or lost or, or, or missing their mom. If they want to call home, everyone will help. And if they're need to go to a police station to be helped, so then they'll do that. And people will even 
form committees to just three or four ladies get together to, to accompany a little girl home when she gets lost, takes the wrong train. Um, it's, it's, it's a delight. And just to be in America, they call, you know, all that religiosity and no decency. It's, 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 it's terrible. Um, improving societal solving is a big deal. It's easy to do. The Americans just need to go do the mental work and stop running around hoping that some shortcut belief is going to uh, make it so they don't have to work hard and sweat like the Asians and the Europeans have done. Self-causation. You change yourself. And here's the valid part of religion. Religion is basically this search for an authority outside of me that I can use to force me to change. And you can call it God or Bingo Bingo or the giant cheese in the sky, whatever you want to call it. It's a sincerely but emotionally felt authority outside of me from the standpoint of which I can judge me harshly and tell me I really got to change. I got to stop this and I got to start this and I can't do it by myself. My existing self is hopeless. I need to rebuild a better self with the help of something stronger and smarter than me. Now, isn't that it? That's the prayer thing, right? The prayer attitude, right? That's extremely useful self-change practice. And it's in every religion in the world. And every religion in the world is useful for self-change in that uh, perspective. Now, the fact that each of the things outside of me that has authority over me has a certain other sets of things I have to do. I have to eat this and not eat that. And I have to torture prostitutes and kill them, but I never torture gangsters or kill them and all this stuff. So you, you end up with this giant set of stupid beliefs from 2,000 years ago written in books. That's the cost of that. But if you look at the actual practice involved, it's extremely useful for self-change. It's an authority, self-causation we call it. The authority outside the self we at times need in order to change yourself. And it gets us out of the paradox that this ugly, selfish, lazy self that I am is going to make me better. You see, how, how am I with an instrument that corrupt going to make myself uncorrupt? And so I need something outside from the benefit to judge and clean myself in order to move myself in a better direction. Self-causation is also a self-making process. And it's the same in three very different areas. Ancient religious practices, not beliefs, but practices. Modern therapies and the performing arts all have the same self-change process. Namely, I change being my opinions to a person who has opinions, some of which change when I discover that my opinions are bigoted or wrong, when new data comes in. A person who is his opinions defends them when they're attacked because he bases his pride on them being right or better than others. But a person who has opinions doesn't base his pride on them. And so as you become an adult, you, what you base your pride on shrinks, like the Dalai Lama says, to nothing. And anything you do can be attacked without making you angry or defensive because you don't base your pride on that. Your pride comes from the fact that you now are where you were before you were born, and you now are where you will be after you die. And all of this human stuff is a show. It is not serious. Um, Self-causation has a third dimension called emotion management via the arts of daily living. This is the fact that in Europe and in parts of China, not and in a, a few parts in Japan, people actually use daily living, weekly and daily arts to manage their own emotional life. And that's what the arts are all about. Now, TV is a bit of that. And, you know, there are these exceptions that get through the greed. Uh, but, you know, you have to be the person who uses the arts around flooded and pointed at you, most of the greedy crap, and, you know, throw away the greedy crap and spot the parts that have value for managing the emotions that you actually face or need. And then finally, self-causation has a fourth part, which is called diversity science. Uh, what kinds of diversity help the diverse kinds of tasks that I'm doing? This kind of task is helped by this kind of diversity and hurt by that kind of diversity. This other kind of task is helped by this different kind of diversity and helped by this other kind of diversity. So there isn't a thing that diversity helps in general. It does not help in general. It helps certain tasks and it hurts other tasks. There's a ratio. And you have to use judgment and investigation and research to find out which kind of task is helped by which kind of diversity. And this tells you what kind of self to build and what kind of diverse exposures you need to have a decent self. 